You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era and fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine and actress-writer Nan McNamara. So Steve, did Ava Gardner and Howard Hughes have a good relationship? Well, they did until he dislocated her jaw. What? Well, don't worry. She hit him back with an ashtray. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign is the gin joint for you. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. The cream of the crop! Hello, and welcome to Triviality, the game where lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name is Matt, and I will be your host today. Uh, Today, we are going to have the ever-popular three-for-all with our contestants, Jeff, Ken, and Neil. How are you guys doing? Excellent. How are you today? I'm doing great. Sounds like you're kind of peppy this morning. Yeah, well, I actually got to sleep in a little bit. We're not recording at 7 a.m., which is really nice. Uh, yeah, that is nice. Yes, yeah, so we got a, got a little coffee. Uh, good to go. How are you guys doing over there? Uh, doing pretty good. Uh, looking forward to the game. We have uh, we all have the same mic this time, which normally doesn't happen, so that's good. <laughs> I am uh, not the peppy one in the group today. I'm feeling a little under the weather, but I think we'll get it done anyways. <laughs> I think I think we have no choice but to get it done. That works to my advantage. Uh, so the game, as is usually played, 20 questions in a variety of topics, worth 10 points apiece, and split into two rounds. At halftime, there will be a special swing round designed by our host, me, where players can rack up some extra points. At the end of regulation, players will enter the final round with the points they've accumulated and will have the chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. The cream will rise to the top, oh yeah. All right, you guys ready to get going? Sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. Lay it on me. Awesome. All right. Question one in everyone's favorite topic, drinking. A fuzzy navel is made by taking peach schnapps and adding equal parts orange juice. What would make this drink a hairy navel? I am in with a guess. You know, I just have to logic this one out and uh, and guess that this is correct, but I don't know. I'm in with a guess. Yeah. Would you guys be comfortable ordering a hairy navel? No. I don't really drink, so <laughs> not, not, not particular. really. I have a guess. I mean, not at, at a bar anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Very quietly with the hand over the mouth. They, uh, or renewal. Maybe in like a back alley somewhere. <laughs> I wouldn't trust a back alley bartender. You guys all in? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Ken, you were in first. What'd you say? I went uh, grapefruit juice instead of the orange juice. Okay. Uh, I went the other way. I said peppermint schnapps. All right. Oh, that makes sense. I was trying to think of changing the liquor to, to something that would put hair on your chest, but I actually just changed it to strawberry because it has small hairs on, on oh, strawberry. Well, that's a great guess. Neil was headed in the right direction. Uh, it is something that would put hair on your chest, and the answer is vodka. Hmm. If you add vodka to it, it's going to make it a hairy navel. Eh, makes sense. Oh, you just add vodka in addition yeah. rather than taking the schnapps You're out. not changing anything. Uh, gotcha. You're just making it a stronger drink. Okay. A little, a little manlier, apparently. <laughs> So that's uh, that's nothing. Yeah, anything with peach schnapps is not going to be considered a manly beverage. I feel like vodka would be the neutral alcohol of all of them, the really. Cha- the chaotic neutral. Yeah. All right, moving to question two. The SETI Institute is a non-for-profit research organization. What does SETI stand for? You guys familiar with SETI? I've heard it for mm-hmm. sure, and I, I just can't place uh, place where I heard it. If it was spelled, I think I'd have a better chance, but... Do you want to give I us can, the... I can give you the spelling. S-E-T-I, I take that it. That is correct. Nope, nope, that didn't help. <laughs> Got you farther away. I, try, I tried as hard as I could to come up with a funny acronym, and I, I could not do that either, so. So t- tapping out for Ken. So, yeah. um, I'm going to guess the I stands for institute, so I think I'm 25% of the way there. I guessed the Socioeconomic Teaching Institute. Okay. I don't think that's right. I just put Southeastern Tremors Institute. All right, so if I said that the truth was out there, would that help you guys? Oh, yeah, I, I have heard a of little, this. A little bit. I've uh, totally heard of this. Yeah. yeah, so it's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Yeah, I've, mm-hmm. I've heard about this on various like science yeah. podcasts and talk shows and stuff. And, the, and they've never heard anything back yet, but they keep trying. I think it's been around since like the 1980s. There's no points there. Moving on to question three, uh, something in geography, so maybe we can get a point or two on the board here. Uh, located in Seattle, Washington, this fishy public farmer's market is the 33rd most visited tourist attraction in the world. I'm in. Man, you'd think this would ring a bell with me, but uh, not so much. Nothing in Seattle? Mm, I haven't been. 
I, I should have been. You guys been to Seattle? No. Uh, I haven't. It seems like it'd be a fun place to go. Jeff and I had a friend who was living in Washington for a while, and we neglected to uh, to make, take a trip up there. But uh, You guys still friends after that? Yeah, yeah. But okay. hopefully we'll write that wrong uh, soon. I'd still like to go for PodCon. I've got an answer, but I don't think it's right. Like, I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, hold on. <laughs> it's it's a fishy, fishy farmer's market? Mm-hmm. Nope, yeah. never mind. I'm not changing my answer. It's not going to make a difference. All right. All right. Everybody is in. Uh, Neil, the most confident there. Uh, Neil, what did you go with? That would be the birthplace of Starbucks, Pike's Place. Mm. All right. I definitely have the wrong city, but I went Fisherman's Wharf. Okay. I just said Market Day. <laughs> Market Day is uh, not located just in Seattle. It's in every uh, grade school across the country. Uh, it is uh, Pike's Place. Um, fishy meaning it's that uh, on the wharf, it's where they toss the fish. It's mm-hmm. kind of pretty famous. I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. I can see it in my head. I just I, I know of the Pike's Place uh, coffee blend. Yeah, I'm also very familiar with the Pike's Place coffee blend. All right, moving on to question four. Which president was responsible for the set of domestic programs labeled the Great Society? No, oh, I'm good. I'm gonna the just go ahead and award society. myself points too right away. The Great Society. Jeff is very confident in this one. Domestic programs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. Uh. Yeah. Between two, but I don't know. I'm just not gonna think about it. I mean, <laughs> the best way to be on a trivia show, not think about it. What do you think, Jeff? You're already in, right? Everybody's in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Jeff, you were first. What do you think? Sure. Um, When Neil said that he was stuck between two, um, I'm thinking he's going with one of two three-lettered, often initialed Mm -hmm. presidents. Um, He may have gone FDR for the New Deal, but I went LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, for his great society. Okay. Uh, Neil, what did you end up with? Uh, Basically what Jeff said. I ended up with FDR and was thinking of um, actually LBJ and Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Ken? I was kind of along the same lines where I thought maybe that was lumped in with the New Deal, but I didn't quite remember that. Um, and I felt like it was somebody more modern, but I still went with FDR. All right, and the answer is Lyndon B. Johnson. Good uh, job, Jeff. Yeah. The goal was to end poverty and racial injustice, which, you know. Still working on it. <laughs> I mean, he did, uh, the legislation he enacted at that time did make for a pretty decent step forward. Mm-hmm. So, Baby steps. So as long as we don't take any more steps back <laughs> in the near future, that would be nice. Yes, and no comment on that one. Well, he took two steps forward. We're on the one step back. Is that how it's going? <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, opposites attract. Question five. It's time for question five. Our listener submitted a question. Uh, if you have a good question that you'd like to send us um, and so we can incorporate into the game, just send it to trivialitypodcast at gmail.com. Uh, make sure you put question five in the subject line. Uh, today we don't have one because we're kind of running out. A little hint, hint for the listeners if they like to send us some. Um, so you're going to have to listen to one of my questions. Which movie won the 1957 Best Picture Award despite not being about the San Antonio Spurs MVP, MVP candidate swingman at all? So there's no way I could get this just by the year and the and the you know figuring out as a film question. So I'm trying to decipher the hint. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, I don't know a lot about basketball. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful enough that I know that the San Antonio Spurs is a basketball team. <laughs> yeah. It's a step in the right direction. Okay. How confident are you, Neil? 100%. 100%. He should be, yeah. I, I needed a little bit of both, and I only had had uh, a base of knowledge in one of the, I have, the aspects. I have a knowledge base in neither. So. All right, I'm in. <laughs> so everybody's in? <clears throat> yep. All right, uh, let's start with uh, Ken. I just went with it happened one night. Okay. I said breakfast at Tiffany's. And Neil. I believe uh, you're referring to the Ernest Borgnine uh, picture uh, named Marty after Marty Ginobili. No. Is that right? Oh. Actually, uh, the bridge on the River Kwai. Oh, uh, geez. Kwai Kwai Leonard? Kwai Leonard. (laughs) Very nice. Yes. it's it's His name is Marty Ginobili, right? uh, Manu Ginobili. Manu Ginobili. Oh, see, then I was mixed up. You were really 100% on I, that one. I, figured, <laughs> I know. I felt really good about it. <clears throat> Ginobili was the only name I had for sure, but I was like, there's no way there's anything here. That's somebody that, would so. come through with like a David Robinson Admiral movie or something. What I felt bad about was I didn't think Marty was late 50s. I thought it was 60s. Mm-hmm. Who was the guy who was married to Ava Longoria? Does he even play on the Tony Spurs Tony Parker. Anymore? Is he still on the Spurs? 
He is still on the Spurs, but oh. I don't believe they are married anymore. Marty was 55, so that was close. Well, I was right in my assessment that if I had known the basketball player, I could have gotten the movie, but that's and okay. James Harden is on the Rockets, right? I'm not even on the same team for that. Okay, yeah, cool. you're... Yes. Well, after five, I have zero points. Oh, I think right. Neil has 10, and Jeff has 10 as well, right? Oh, man. So my, ac- <clears throat> my accidentally brutal game again. <laughs> that's okay. Great radio. <laughs> All right, question six. If you take the first name of a president... Combine it with the last name of his successor, you get this funk legend. Mm -hmm. I'm in. Me too. 100% this time. I don't (laughs) know what I was thinking last time. Actual 100%? Yeah. I'm feeling good. The fact that I'm not getting there this fast is disturbing. Mm -hmm. How well do you know your funk legends? Well, that's what I'm trying to think is, I mean, I could do, well, you know what? I could do all of these real quick. Hold on. Let me do all all 45 combos. No, please. Oh, my God. (laughs) It's not Barack Trump. If you wanted to get past that one. <laughs> so the first, famous first <laughs> yeah. name is the first and last name is the first and then the successor is the last name. Correct. Okay. We're keeping a hard time around this. Because otherwise Jeff will go through every yeah. single presidential combination. The good the, the thing is with these questions, Jeff will never give up until we force him to. Because uh, he right, feels like he up. should know it. Write an answer. Okay. Okay, we're all in. So we're we're gonna start with Jeff because he, I don't think he knows. They they forced me on time. I, I'm pretty sure I would have gotten there eventually, but I went George Adams. Okay, oh. you're you're, <laughs> you're so close. Very close. Uh, Ken, why don't you start? I have George Clinton. George Clinton. George Clinton. Funk legend George Clinton. Oh yeah, that makes so much sense. Whew. I swear to God, I thought you were gonna pull that out. I was gonna be so mad. Walked into it without knowing who it was. All right, moving on to question seven. In the United States, the courts have generally decided that 18 is the age someone has reached adulthood. If horses had the same judicial system, how old would colts and fillies be when they matured into adulthood? Okay, I'm in. Jeff, give me some Because I don't race race horses. (laughs) No, (laughs) you would lose. They're very fast. I just own race horses. Do do you? No. Okay, I'm in with, uh, I'm in. All right, everybody in? Yep, yep. All right, Jeff. I went three. Okay, Ken? Two. And Neil? Uh, I was going to go three. I was going to go two, but I know horses grow fast, and I thought maybe it was a trick, so I just went with one. And it's actually four. (laughs) I actually, I wondered if I was a little low. We're bad. (laughs) At four years old, fillies and colts mature into mares and stallions, respectively. Uh, That's only, it's a very distinct as far as when in breeding and in horse racing and when they're adults. Maybe three was the last year they can race them. That's maybe what I was thinking. Yeah. And then at five, I think they can rent a car is how that works. Question eight. This Philly set show concluded its seven season run with the iconic line, class dismissed. Seven seasons? Seven seasons. Yep, I'm good. Class dismissed. Philly. And if it's not this show, I'm going to be mad at you. So... Because I just want it. I just need the points at this point, Matt. I'm pleading. <laughs> okay, I'm in. I'm shaping up for my worst first round ever. Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, wait. I'm just... Okay, well, I could say this out loud because everybody else is in. I'm between Boy Meets World and Saved by the Bell. I definitely kind of remember Feeney saying class dismissed in Boy Meets World, like towards the end. I feel that was on much longer than seven seasons, though. It went from, like, grade school all the way to college. How could that have only been seven seasons? They, there is like at least two or three years when they were in college. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Up your nose with a rubber hose. That's right. Saved by the Bell couldn't have been on seven seasons though either. Welcome All right, back. I'm going Boy Meets World. Okay, you're in with Boy Meets World. Yeah. What did you say, Jeff? Boy Meets World. And Neil? I really wanted to put Welcome Back, Cotter. I thought it was a Vinnie Barbarino's Dream Machine reference, but I put Boy Meets World. And the answer is Boy Meets World. It actually did only last seven seasons. Man, that seemed like it was on forever. But Ken, um, to answer your question, how can you get from grade school to college? Uh, You can do that pretty easily. But I remember like three (laughs) seasons when they were in college. Well, they also were like 14-year-olds playing 10-year-olds. And and all of a sudden, they were just... In high school, one year, and then the next year they were seniors, and then they were basically right. okay. In look, I'm just, I'm just saying, it seemed like it was, yeah, it was for a, a lot longer jump. than it was. Yeah. When I was at the um, celebrity and sync uh, tour date, <laughs> I saw Danielle Fischel, who played Topanga, by the sound booth because she was dating Lance Bass oh, at the I know, time. I know. We all that's, know how that that's, turned that's out. That's your, that's your big crush, right? 
growing up? Who? Yeah. No, Topanga. No, that's not my big crush. Oh, really? She's no. a huge wrestling fan now. She goes. To she, all really? the, she goes to all the local shows out in uh, L.A. The, the other thing was, I, I I was pretty sure Boy Meets World was in Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah. He used it, it was and, a big and Saved by the Bell was uh, not. I was positive yeah. of that. Plus Matt's affinity for TGIF. <laughs> early, they used to go to Phillies games, and there was always like Philly references early on. They kind of dropped that later on, but we'll do a bonus episode. The people keep writing in; it'll just be all questions about my my crushes. Well, I'm glad <laughs> I went the right way on that. All right, so yeah. I've got Anna Kornikova. That's the only one I know yeah, for right. sure. <laughs> That's the sports one. Yeah. <laughs> well, points all around on that one. Uh, moving on to question nine. When valuing a company, what is the PDE ratio referring to? Got it. This one might be skewed a little towards Jeff. Not really. Okay, I have a guess. We work in a bank. They have to talk about this at some point, right? I'm so low down the totem pole, I never talk about PDE. <laughs> oh, wait. I'm changing part of this. Okay. I just used to watch a lot of Kramer, so I'm good. <laughs> Mad Money? Okay. He told me I should never buy Tesla stock. How'd that okay. work out for you? <laughs> I don't have any money, so it, it was irrelevant. <laughs> it didn't matter. All right, everybody is in. Let's start with Neil on this one. I had no idea. I just put net profit. Okay. I Ken? went with uh, profit to expense. All right. And Jeff? That'd be profit to earnings, I believe. Oh. It's actually price to earning ratio. Price oh. to earning. Uh, it's the price of the stock um, compared to the earnings per share. Hmm. So it, mm-hmm. it, it has something to do with all of those. It's just kind of broken down to a ratio. We all said financial stuff. Yeah, you did all say words that the had only to one do with I was positive. It's hard to it's hard to answer a financial question, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you don't have any money, right? But hey, uh, check out patreoncom slash podcast. Yeah, <laughs> then maybe we can invest. Right, our PDE ratio is a little low at this point. The good news about not having any money is we know how to spend frugally. So at I least mean, your yeah. dollars are going to. I the mean, right I, I'm personally a multi thousandaire. <laughs> yeah, today our craft services are uh, pumpkin and M M&M and M candy. So yeah, that's our lunch today. All right, uh, last question of round one. On a rainbow, what color is the sixth from the top? Well, this is interesting because we had a nice double rainbow in uh, in Chicago over oh. the skies last oh, night. I didn't see it on every single person's Facebook Yeah, yesterday. right. It was pretty annoying. Because <laughs> it was the first rainbow they'd ever seen. Okay, I, I'm in. I'm you just... said sixth from the, the top. The sixth from the top. They're, mm. pretty, they're pretty common. The double rainbow? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nobody would care if it wasn't for that video. My favorite thing about the rainbow, though, is it's incomplete. So a okay. rainbow is actually a full circle, hmm. but it's really the, cool in airplanes if you've ever seen those. Yeah, this like one airplane. this one looked really bold yesterday, and it actually looked like it it was like touching down, which I know is not the case. It just like looks like that, but this one was so strong that you could see it like go all the way to the horizon. All right, everybody in. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's start with Jeff. So sixth from the top, going down: red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. I went indigo. Okay. Uh, also Ken? known as cyan. But. I went with violet. And Neil? I went indigo. It is indigo. Oh, boy. The old uh, Roy G. Biv will get you oh, there. Oh, jeez. Yeah. That I, I'm <laughs> dumb. <laughs> I almost wrote a question about what did Roy G. Biv stand for, uh, but I went with this question instead, and two out of three ain't bad. I'm dumb. <laughs> You're not? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we'll get there. All right. So after round one... Um, coming up in third right now is Ken with 20. Uh, in second with 30 is Jeff and Neil in the driver's seat with 40. It's a, it's a self-driving car, so I'm not doing much. So. <laughs> Speaking of self-driving cars, we'd like to thank our sponsor for today, Tesla Motors. Thanks, Elon Musk, for, uh, for the millions, for the millions yeah. of dollars, uh, for our, uh, price to earnings ratio. Yeah. So, you know, uh, go out there, buy a Tesla, buy a rocket. Yeah. Buy one of those fancy space suits that look like they're from uh, Interstellar. No, they're they're <laughs> in obviously in a Daft Punk music video. <laughs> All right, moving on to the swing round. Um, so for this one, I'm going to ask a question. There are going to be nine correct answers. Uh, you're going to get ten points for each one you name correctly. Um, I'm making it ten points because I'm not sure how many of these you guys are going to get. Um, because it's a sports question. <laughs> so out of uh, it's nine total. Out of nine total. Okay. You guys ready? Mm -hmm. It's rock and roll. All right. There are nine U.S. sports teams that don't end in the letter S. Name them. Okay. One of my favorite questions. It's pretty good. So just for the listeners at home, because um, this is the kind of thing you could think about, uh, you know, all day and probably come up with it. uh, We're putting like a three minute timer. Let's do a three minute timer. Sure. Man, you you think about the teams and you keep thinking about... uh, 
ones that the end SNS. us. Yeah. Like bulls. Oh. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> bulls, Blackhawks, Bears. Cubs. Yeah. Wonderful. Our Chicago centric podcast, apparently. That can't be right. There's no way I've got five of these. There must be a hockey one. I think when, one. when this question first came out, Las Vegas didn't have a team. And I was like, wait, does that start? No, nope, we're good. It, we're it does good. end with it the does. Nest, It doesn't so. change it. So I don't have to worry about that. They actually have the best winning percentage of all time currently as of this uh, this recording. So I believe they're 1-0 mm-hmm. as a franchise. So after uh, our three-minute timer, it looks like I ended up with seven. Jeff ended up with seven answers, and Neil with five. Yeah, you got we'll five written down. We'll see if they're correct or not. But oh, right. I see Neil uh, got one that I missed. Well, let's start with Ken. What do you have? I went with the Heat. The possibly not a team anymore, but I think they are. The Jazz, <laughs> mm-hmm. White Sox, Red Sox, the Wild, the Lightning, and the Thunder. Okay, and Jeff. I'm disappointed that I missed OKC, but I had Utah Jazz, Minnesota Wild, uh, Chicago White Sox, Boston Red Sox, Colorado Avalanche, Mm. and I had the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Miami Heat. Okay. And Neil? Uh, I had Miami Heat, Orlando Magic. That's the ninth. Um, Yeah, we got all nine between us. Boston Red Sox, (laughs) Chicago White Sox, and then I wasn't sure if Wild was a team, but luckily Ken and and, uh, Jeff said it, so Wild. All right, so big round for you guys. Uh, Ken with 70, Jeff with 70, and Neil with 50. Um, Just in order, what I had was the Miami Heat, the Orlando Magic, the Utah Jazz, the Oklahoma City Thunder, Boston Red Sox, Chicago White Sox, Colorado Avalanche, Tampa Bay Lightning, and Minnesota Wild. So to answer a question you posed earlier, there has to be a football one. There apparently doesn't have to be a football one. There does not have to be a football one. Not creative in the NFL. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm glad we got all of them between us. I knew about the NFL, though, because I went through all 32 teams. Hmm. So, Yeah, that's what I started with, and it it really bogged my time down because I was going through each conference. (laughs) That was easy. I mean, for me, I just basically went west to east coast. and They just all showed up in my head, so I was like, all right, I can pretty much rule the head out. (laughs) Some kind of sports rain man. Right. All right, well, good job, gentlemen. Well, I know the NFL pretty well. I I was an avid watcher for a long time. so It's a very impressive swing round for you guys. All right, let's see if we can keep that momentum going into round two. Uh, question one is going to be a little bit of music math. So take the number in Curtis Jackson's alter ego and subtract the amount of times he has claimed to have been shot. Ugh. <laughs> how am I supposed to know how many times? He has said this on multiple interviews and it's very widely known. I'm in. There's no way I could be right on, on the gunshot. <laughs> I'm close. <laughs> I'm, I'm within one or two. Double digits, guys? What do we think? <laughs> I'm in, so... How often has this man been shot? I wish there was, like, a really vague clue that reified the number in my head. I, rem- yeah. I do remember. At one point, he has said he's been hit with a few shells, but he doesn't walk with a limp. He's quoting some Curtis I'm, Jackson. I'm in. All I'm right. not going to get all any in. closer. We're all in. Everybody in? Yeah. All right. Uh, Ken, what did you say? So, uh, Curtis Jackson is 50 cent. I say he was shot nine times Okay. for a... Uh, a difference of 41. I, I completely agree with that, and I said 41. Really? Okay. I said 41. The answer oh is 41. God, yeah. <laughs> Everyone how I, knows how many times 50 Cent has been how shot. How the hell did I get that? I yeah. was hoping it was eight so that the answer would be number 42. <laughs> <laughs> nope, 41 there. When I originally wrote that question, it ended up, I was going to be named the punk band that it comes, and it was going to be some 41 question. No, that's what I was... But I thought there was too much there. So I dialed it back a little bit. Well, if you wanted to do a sum 41, it should add up to 41, not not take away to 41. How did I know you was shot that's nine true. times? It, it's somewhere in your head. You had to have yeah. heard it before. <laughs> All right, question two. Phoebe, Rhea, and Daphnis are not actually the names of a hot new girl group, but actually the names of moons of what planet? Phoebe, Rhea, and Daphnis. Can you spell Daphnis? Yep, D-A-P-H-N-I-S, and that may be pronounced wrong. Okay, got a guess then. I'm in. Okay. I, I can't remember if these are the moons. I don't think these are the moons named after Shakespeare characters. Jeff would know that. You pretty confident, Jeff? I have a good reason for why I picked what I picked, mm-hmm. but I'm I'm between two, so... I'm between Saturn and Neptune. I've ruled out eight, so that's a good start. Or I'm seven. just going to go with Saturn. You can't rule out Pluto. Even though it's not Pluto. So that's my guess. Uh, yeah. Saturn. Okay, I actually uh, didn't feel it was Saturn, and I didn't feel it was Jupiter. I went with Neptune. Okay. 
Um, I'm, I know it's not Mercury that has none. Venus has none. Earth has the moon. So you guys all the, knew The those. hubris of us to name our own moon, moon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also agree with Ken. I don't feel like it was uh, Jupiter or Saturn. So I went one further out. I'm pretty sure Neptune is the one Neil's thinking of with the planets named after uh, Shakespeare characters. So I went Uranus. Uranus. All right. And Neil, you said Saturn? Saturn, yeah. Or the original Greek, Uranus. So the answer is Saturn. Ooh. So Neil gets it. Actually, uh, Saturn has a ton of moons. Neil gets like the science 60 or question. So. Yeah. I got one geography question and one science question. How about that? Yeah, I had actually, I forgot. I was looking it up and like the... Oh, yeah, I should have Rhea. Rhea is one of the more famous ones. All right, question three. Adjusting for inflation, 2009's Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 is the most expensive game to produce of all time at $279 million, with 2013's GTA 5 coming in second at $272 million. Which pre-2000 PlayStation title is third at an approximate $216 million when accounting for inflation? Pre-2000 PlayStation mm-hmm. title. So this is the price to produce the game? Correct. The most expensive game to make. I think big expensive games of the late 90s. I didn't have a PlayStation, so my knowledge base is more Nintendo, if anything. I'm kind of surprised at the just the fact that it would be a PlayStation title that was pre-2000 that cost that much. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, it is inflation adjusted. I I have a guess. Okay. Yeah, I have a guess. Ken was in first, so let's go with Ken. So just based on the fact that I'm a big fan... First of all, and uh, I don't know, it's kind of a big, a big title, kind of sweeping animatics for the time, and uh, just generally a long, um, big game. I went with Final Fantasy VII. Okay, Jeff. I thought about going like Gran Turismo or the original GTA. I also went Final Fantasy VII. Okay. I just. Uh... Just for the fact that I remember getting this with the first PlayStation, and I figured the fact that the graphics had advanced so rapidly, I went with Madden. Could okay. also be Final Fantasy Eight or Nine. Well, the answer is actually Final Fantasy Seven. Ooh, yay. <laughs> points for Ken and Jeff there. Uh, actually, the marketing cost alone for this game was a hundred million dollars. No, that's what um, it was. It was originally supposed to be on the, the Nintendo because uh, Square used to put all their games on Nintendo. Um, but they couldn't fit it all in a cartridge. It actually mm-hmm. probably would have been more expensive to produce it on the Nintendo because uh, PlayStation had discs. I think, what was it, three discs, four discs, something like that yeah. when it came out? Um, four. Eight definitely eight had four discs, and so did nine. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy to think that games like used to come in multiple. Well, when you think about it, I, I think Final Fantasy VII was on three. Three well, sounds right. I think, think just it? the end was on the third disc. Yeah, the, the final cave. When you think about it, though, I'm pretty sure that the storage capacity for a, a CD-ROM is like 700 meg. Yeah. So when you're talking about um, like high high density Blu-ray and stuff, that's like 50 gig now. It's right. It's so much more data dense. And now games just get downloaded directly to your console. People don't even buy games anymore. So, all right. Question four. In a classic scene from 30 Rock, what was the name of the novelty song about a coming-of-age monster sung by a series star Tracy Jordan slash Tracy Morgan? I love you, Matt. <laughs> coming-of-age monster. Are any of you familiar with the show? Yes. Uh, I don't watch 30 Rock. Uh, you're missing I do, out, I can know. kind of see Tracy Morgan like dressed up in this costume. This is the classic muffin top. <laughs> <laughs> the rural juror. R- rural juror. <laughs> Urban fervor. <laughs> <laughs> there was a terrible murder. Rachel You're, Dretch is really funny in that. Actually, anyone, I think my favorite Rachel Dretch um, character is the one where she's like the cat wrangler. Yeah. <laughs> if we have any uh, 30 Rock super fans, we are looking to do a 30 Rock late on me. If you think you're a candidate, just let us know. Okay, I'm in. All right. Ken and Jeff are in. Neil is writing something. Yeah, I've never really seen the show, so I'm just throwing random words out. Okay. Uh, Neil, we'll start with your random words. You said coming of age, so I just put puberty of the opera. <laughs> okay. That would be interesting. So, uh, I, I kind of remember this, but there's no way I could come up with the name of this song. But I think it was like a Teen Wolf sort of thing. So mm-hmm. I just went with the Teen Wolf rap. Okay. I think you're very close, Ken, because I feel like the song in question is Werewolf Bar Mitzvah. Yeah. It okay. is Werewolf Bar Mitzvah. <laughs> 10 points for Jeff. <laughs> Spooky, scary, boys becoming men. Men, Men becoming, becoming wolves. wolves. It's literally like an eight-second clip, but it's just stuck yeah, now with me. I, I remember, and, uh, yeah. It's become a Halloween classic. <laughs> but I did. I remembered him dressed up as a werewolf, for sure. <laughs> All right, question five. 
Led by their star quarterback, this team won the first two Super Bowls uh, in 1967 and 1968. I'm good. Okay. I'm in. Ken is in. This should be a lot easier for me. I'm, I'm thinking it's um, either the Packers, the Cowboys, or the Steelers, and I'm trying to remember. I think Terry Bradshaw was a little later than Super Bowl one or two, and I'm trying to Bart Starr. All right, uh, Neil. Why don't you say what what do you think it is? Uh, Cowboys. Okay. And if I deciphered the clue correctly, I might get a sports question right. I went Mm. with Cowboys. All right. Uh, I feel like this is the Vince Lombardi-led Packers. So Bart Starr being the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, it's the Green Bay Packers. I knew it was Packers, and I thought, who's the guy, who am I thinking of, um, of the Cowboys? Roger Staubach? Staubach. Bart Starr is from Packers. I thought you were talking about the Cowboys logo. No. I, when no. he said, oh, Bart Starr. Right. I know. Then I, was got like, it. I, was I was like, like right there. Wait, I was looking at, I was, because I saw a documentary on like, the original Cowboys and I was looking mm-hmm. at Staubach. No, know. Roger Staubach, who is the wealthiest quarterback in the NFL. His uh, his wealth has accumulated since his retirement. He's really? like $700 million now. Yeah. Man. He's got a good PD Between ratio. In, yeah, endorsements and somebody doing great investments for him. <laughs> well, good for him. Looks like Jeff's doing pretty good this round. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I shouldn't have gotten... The one I got wrong is a planets question. Sweet. <laughs> and then you get the sports and the pop culture questions, yeah. correct? This is a... What is this world coming bizarre to? Bizarro world today. All right, question six. Billy Blanks is the creator and memorable spokesperson for this 90s trend. I'm in, finally. I, r- uh, I wrote this one for Neil. Billy Blanks. <laughs> you, you probably heard it everywhere in yeah. 1992. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, we had sort of a, an off-color trivia team name. With this in the title when I was in high school. All right. Looks like everybody is in. Uh, Ken, what do you say? Well, I I had to kind of dig deep and remember where I remembered the name um, Billy Blanks from. And I think he's from the Tybo infomercials. Uh, Neil, what did you say? Uh, It is Tybo. And I just want to reference Billy Blanks' great performance in The Last Boy Scout where he (laughs) scores a touchdown and says, ain't life a bitch, and then blows himself away. (laughs) So. It's a real thing? Oh, yeah, it's real. Yeah. The that opening of Last Boy Scout. He's a running back, and uh, he scores a touchdown by shooting people on his way to the, t- to the end zone. Jeff, did you get Tybo? No, I couldn't get Billy Mays out of my head, so <laughs> I said OxyClean. OxyClean. <laughs> Billy, Billy Mays here. here. Oh, wonderful. All right, points for Ken and Neil on that one. Question seven. A standard pinochle deck contains only two sets of six different cards in all four suits. What are the six cards that are used? It would have been easier to try and spell Pinochle, and I'm guaranteeing I won't do that well either. I believe it's P-I-N-O-C-H-L-E. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Ten right. points take, for Neil. I'll take points for that. <laughs> <laughs> no fictional point awarding. So there's six different cards okay, from I'm two in. sets with all four suits. I've never played this. I don't know how it's played. I have a guess. I've never played it either, but it was it looked interesting. It's one of those games. I always want to look up card games because these questions get asked all the time. Yeah, we never do. So I decided to do it for once. <laughs> All right, everybody locked in? Yep. His madness may just be correct. All right, well, let's start with Neil's madness then. I just put 2, 5, 7, 10, Jack, and King. Okay. <laughs> Random cards? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Jeff? I thought maybe they ran 3 to 9. Okay. And, and I went uh, 9 through Ace. It runs 9, 10, Jack, Queen, King, and Ace. Ooh. Points for Ken. Uh, it actually has a kind of a weird scoring system too. It goes Ace, then 10, then King, Quack, King, Quack. <laughs> King, Queen, Jack, and then nine. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always like playing King Quack. Pocket King Quack is my favorite. <laughs> All right. Minus 10 for Jeff. <laughs> All right. Question eight. Uh, theobromine is the addictive alkaline found in this sweet treat. Got it. Theobromine. Theobromide. Not bromide. bromide. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yes, that makes all the difference. You're like, ah, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. For a second, I was... Uh... It might be bromine. I think it's theobromide. I'm pretty it's sure. It's with an N-E at the end. Oh, is it? Theobromide? Okay. I misheard you then. You got to re- got to read your answer then? No, I have the right answer. <laughs> oh, very confident, is, Jeff. For the record, I'm not certain. But... You have a good idea? I have an educated guess. I think that theobromide is what makes it dangerous for dogs to eat, despite the fact that I've been consuming a lot of it this morning, and I said chocolate. Okay. Uh, Neil? I put pixie sticks. Same okay. here, pixie sticks. It is chocolate. Hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 Jeff gets there through science. Am I also right, though, that that's the thing that makes it... Um, it's hard for dogs to break down, I think, and it builds up, and I think that's why it's toxic for them. I well, see. According to my notes, I wrote chocolate. 
So <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing else for you. I, th- I think I'm right, though. Feel free to Google that. You always think you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll, know, we'll put it in the show notes. That's how overconfidence works. <laughs> All right. Question nine. While not listed in his complete works, usually, this Greek philosopher is believed to have created the world's first alarm clock. Put down a guess. Okay. So it's like a uh, a sundial that blocks the light from like some water. No, it's, it's, it's actually like a series of like tubes and, and it, bowls that water kind of goes in and out right. of. And then the, uh, the 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 water once it warms up, it rises in the tube and pours itself on a chicken. <laughs> Yeah, which lays or the a eggs. Rooster, a rooster, I should yeah, say. Yeah, then, and then the eggs roll down the conveyor belt and fry themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about Pee Wee's Big Adventure? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Pee Wee uh, not being the Greek philosopher. Everybody in? The fact that I yeah, don't know this is disturbing. All right. Uh, Ken, what did you say? I went with Aristotle. Okay. Neil? I think I missed another spa question. I just went with Socrates. Socrates. Okay. Yeah. And so Jeff? I ruled against Socrates because he didn't really write anything. Um, one, referring to the complete works, um, people often refer to Plato with his dialogue. So I guessed Plato, but I don't know. All right. The answer is Plato. Uh, complete works is the name of his book generally. Uh, so I thought I'd throw that in there. Would anybody like to know who owns the 800 page copy of that? And it's on his shelf at home. Jeff is raising his own hand. <laughs> Very smugly. Like now he's patting his own back. <laughs> no, I can't do that. My shoulders hurt from boxing yes. yesterday. All right, then. Question 10. What state would Live Free or Die Hard be set in if they had taken the movie title straight from the state motto? I'm and down I think to it's... a handful. Okay. And I have a region. And I'm positive it's in the region, but I don't know which state. So I'm yeah, getting, I'm getting like, there. It's like a little weird, <laughs> the answer to this one. I got to go with my gut. Okay. Okay. I've narrowed it down to two, and I'm going to take a 50-50 guess on this. Mm-hmm. And I'm positive it's one of the two now, so this is going to be devastating if I'm wrong. All of our friends on the East Coast probably were in right away on this one. I hope you guys are all thinking of the same state. That would be great. I hope it's right, too. Um, between be uh, between Massachusetts, um, which I don't think it is, and then Maryland and New Hampshire, and I, I, my gut says Maryland, but... I'm going to go with New Hampshire. Okay. Um, So Neil's in with New Hampshire. What did you say, Ken? New Hampshire was definitely one of the ones I was thinking, but I went with Delaware because that's the one that was uh, in my gut. Okay. And what did you go with, Jeff? So bizarrely, I was between Vermont and New Hampshire, and I chose New Hampshire. The answer is New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, The phrase was adopted from a toast written by General John Stark, uh, New Hampshire's most famous soldier of the American Revolutionary War. Poor health forced Stark to decline an invitation to the reunion, um, but he wrote his toast by letter and said, live free or die, death is not the worst of evils. And they decided to make that their motto. And then he was beheaded. I was going to say he also lived at Winterfell (laughs) and was head of the king. (laughs) All right. After our two rounds... uh, Pretty high scores today. We got Ken with 130, Neil with 130, and Jeff in the lead with 170. Yeah, I think the uh, the swing round definitely bolstered our scores a little bit today. Yeah, you guys did a little better than I thought. I probably would have only given you five points if I knew you guys were going to get almost all of them. <laughs> all right, so heading into the final round where each of our contestants can wager up to 30 points um, in any of the five categories up to the points that they have accumulated so far. All right, so what I'm going to do is read the categories, and you guys are going to lock your wagers in. Category one, fears. Category two, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Category three, sports and math. Category four, cartoon cults. And category five, AKAs. All right, all the wagers are locked in. Um, You guys ready for the questions? Indeed, sir. Yep. All right, so in fears. It would be ironic if Julia Child had Majirakophobia, which is the fear of this. And I will spell it for you. It's M-A-G-E-I-R-O-C-O-P-H-O-B-I-A. I I think I pronounced it close. We'll see, though. I'm sure someone will let me know if it's not. Cool. Category two, uh, in Reduce, Reuse, and Recycle. Disney is noted for recycling animation in a lot of their older movies. In the movie Robin Hood, the character of Little John saw a majority of his animation taken from this 1967 Disney movie. 
in sports and math. The Red Zone Network has been a revelation to all football fans, showing live look-ins on all games where the ball is in the red zone. How many yards on a football field are in the red zone? Uh, good deal. Man. Cartoon Colts. The loyal order of the Buffaloes is the fraternity attended by which two classic television characters? Got it. AKAs. If you ever catch this Chicago-made athlete grappling with a novelty nacho-filled helmet at Wrigley Field, don't make the mistake of calling him by his given name, Phil Brooks. I hate you. <laughs> don't call him Phil. <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> I can already tell you what I know and what I don't know, mm-hmm. and I will be at the same score at the end of this. So if one of you can best me, sweet, <laughs> and if one of you can't, yay me. I feel like I remember like Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble being part of that, but why would it be? Everything on that show is is dinosaur themed, so <laughs> right. why the hell would it be Buffalo? I'm going to still go with that. So they just feel stupid, like, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, but I, I, I remember them wearing the big furry hats. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with them. There's horns on the hat, though. Is it mammoths? I'm gonna go with them. All my answers are locked in. Okay. I'm locked in. Everybody, all locked in. Yeah. Yep. All right. Question one in the category of fears. Uh, the question: It'd be ironic if Julia Child had magirocophobia, which is the fear of this. Um, it looked like Neil and Jeff had a fear of wagering because they both went with zero. Uh, Ken in with twenty. So what'd you say, Ken? So, Julia Childs is a famous uh, chef, uh, TV chef to be specific. So, it would be kind of obvious if it was like food or a specific ingredient. But I went with uh, being on camera. Okay. Uh, Jeff? As I think about it, um, something like fire might also be an interesting yeah, answer. Like... Um, but I went the fear of rising pastries. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was going to go something food or like knives, but I went with spies. Okay. Well, it actually is just cooking. It is the oh, fear of no cooking. Way. Yeah. I was, wasn't sure how much you guys knew about Julia Child. It looked like a lot, though. <laughs> kind of knew who she was. All right. Question two. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Disney is noted for recycling animation in a lot of their older movies. In the movie Robin Hood, the character of Lil Jon saw a majority of his animation taken from this 1967 Disney movie. Um, wagers were 10 for Ken and 10 for Jeff. Neil abstaining again. Um, so why don't we just start with Neil, who had nothing to lose on this one. I just went with Fox and the Hound. Okay. Jeff? I said the Jungle Book. Okay. Yeah, Little John was a uh, big bear, and I assume they recycled animation from Baloo from the Jungle Book. All right, the answer is the Jungle Book. Um, he's actually pretty much a carbon copy of Baloo. Uh, most of the scenes, they actually traced over him. Um, there's actually a lot of recycled animation in that movie. It was actually the cheapest movie that Disney ever produced because they used like 60% recycled footage in that movie. Pretty, pretty good one, though. Yeah, it was always one of my favorites, and I didn't know it was that old when I was watching as a kid. Question three, sports and math. Um, the Red Zone Network has been a revelation to all football fans, showing live look-ins in all games where the ball is in the red zone. How many yards on a football field are in the red zone? Um, it looked like no wagers except for Jeff wagering 10. Uh, so, Jeff, what did you say? So the, the red zone is uh, the 20-yard line to the end zone. Mm-hmm. So you said on the football field, so I doubled that because there's one on each side. So I said 40 yards. Okay. Ken? Oh, I just said 10. All right. Oh, uh, I said 20. It's actually 40 because there's 20 mm. on both sides. Mm. Good job on Jeff on Good catching thinking. that one. <laughs> Who did not seem too confident in that. Well, you said in. sports and math. <laughs> so I had to do a little sports and a little bit of math. So you're 50-50 there. Excellent. Uh, question four. Uh, the Loyal Order of the Buffaloes is the fraternity attended by which two classic television characters? Um, Ken wagering big here with 20, uh, Jeff with 10, and Neil not not joining the wagering party yet. Uh, Ken, what did you say? Yeah, um, I was very torn about this one. I really felt like it was Fred and Barney from the Flintstones, but did that make sense that it was Buffalo mm-hmm. when everything was dinosaur themed in the show? I don't know. I went with Fred and Barney. Okay. Does it make sense that they go bowling or meet an alien named Gazoo? I went Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble. All right. And Neil? I went with the same. Yep. It's Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble. Uh, in season one, it actually went by the Loyal Order of the Dinosaur, which would have made more sense. Uh, they changed it to Water Buffaloes. Uh, that's just what they were. All right. And the final question in AKAs. If you ever catch the Chicago-made athlete grappling with a novelty nacho-filled helmet at Wrigley Field, don't make the mistake of calling him by his given name, Phil Brooks. 
Uh, looks like Jeff and Ken both with 10, and Neil still still waiting for question six to wager, it seems like. Uh, Jeff, what did you say? Um, I'm pretty sure that we made reference to this on a previous show, but I, I don't remember. Um, I actually couldn't come up with anything. I couldn't even come up with a funny answer. Okay. Yeah, so you put a lot of information in that question, and for a second I was like, "What? what's he talking about? And then mm-hmm. I was like, wait, just listen to the name. It's uh, CM Punk. Yep, Chicago made punk. Uh, yep, CM Punk. Yep. Uh, so 10 points for Ken there. All right, after doing a little math here and uh, tabulating the scores, coming up in third today is Neil with a very respectable 130. Um, in second is Ken with 150. And today our cream of the crop is Jeff with 190. Yeah, no, I'm living in a nightmare. And I am the cream. The cream of the crop. Well done, Jeff. I can't I can't feel too bad about my performance. I, uh, I racked up some score in the final round there, but... Uh, Jeff was just all around the best. He had a really good second round. Yeah, did pretty good in the final round there, but uh, I figured I'd play it safe today and see what would happen if I bet zero. And um, just happy that uh, I, I batted almost 50 in each round. All right, and thanks to everyone for listening today. Uh, great game by our competitors. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, probably the best way to do it is to visit our website at trivialitypodcast.com or hit us up on Twitter at trivialitypod or on the Facebook uh, basically facebook.com slash triviality pod. Um, if you also like to support us, um, you can visit us at our Patreon, uh, which is, we have links to it at the website and on our Facebook. Uh, we'd like to thank our newest, uh, Patreon, uh, Wesley. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for the donation. Uh, we appreciate, we appreciate all our Patreons and especially our new ones. Yeah, we really do. Um, we've gotten, um, a few more in the last uh, month or so. Um, we're really grateful for that. We really appreciate it. Um, hopefully that's going to help us uh, provide a better product for you guys. And uh, we're just really thrilled that uh, everybody's been liking the show. So it's been really nice. All right. Of course, other than that, uh, other than spreading the word, the best way you can support the show is by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to Triviality on your favorite podcast app. Uh, until next game, uh, on behalf of Ken, Jeff, and Neil, um, my name is Matt, and that was Triviality. Oh, check this out. My key to the city of Gary, Indiana. Mm, look at this. And my gold record from that novelty party song. Werewolf for mitzvah. Spooky, scary. Points we coming, man.